Welcome back to the Long Distance Work Life, where we help you lead, work, and thrive in remote and hybrid teams. I'm Marissa Eikenberry, a fellow remote worker, and joining me is my co-host and remote work expert, Wayne Tramel. Today, also a remote worker for what it's worth. Right? That is also true. <laughs> um, today, we're going to be talking about quiet quitting. So we've heard this phrase in the news a lot lately. And first, I just want to start off with what is quiet quitting anyway? So I did some research. I looked things up. and I'm well, shocked. I'm right? shocked that you, would, that you would look this up. Right. Uh, <laughs> for those of you, if this is your first episode, I'm a huge researcher. So many say that the, uh, it's the idea that you're not quitting your job. You're just quitting the idea of going above and beyond. You're doing exactly what you were hired to do and nothing more. Some people also say that it's known as the idea of not accepting additional work without additional pay. But this phenomenon isn't new. Um, you know, we've just now put a phrase to it that we didn't have before. So why is quiet quitting such an important concept right now? Well, it's an important concept because it is the tail end of the great resignation. Okay. If we're looking at trends and we're looking at, oh, what what crisis are we talking about this <laughs> Yeah. Right. What's, is, the, what's the new phrase? Pretty much how the business press works. Right. Uh, the crisis for the last six months has been the great resignation. Holy moly, people are not crazy about going back to the office or they don't like the people they work with. And since they work from home, the heck with it, I'll just go get a, another job. Or, you know, I've been home for two years and I've realized that this commuting to work thing doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was the great resignation and that's been going on for a while. Part of that group, a subset of that group is people who probably thought about quitting or changing their jobs, okay. but didn't feel the need to, or didn't have the nerve, or for whatever reason, yeah. they said, oh, okay, we're getting back to going back to the office, and we're doing stuff, and and they're finding out, oh, maybe I'm not so crazy about this after all, right? <laughs> maybe I should have gone with the others. That's part of it. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that if you look at who has coined quiet quitting and who is panicked about it. Right. It's largely employers who have been relying on people to go above and beyond and people are not suddenly going above and beyond. And that sounds like this new horrible thing. On the other hand, we used to just call that employee engagement. Right. It's so wild to me because I, I am a person, you know, I'm a self-proclaimed overachiever. This idea of quiet quitting is like really weird to me, but I understand it too. I mean, we're, you know, we've done a past episode, burnout's really high right now. And people are trying to figure out some semblance of mental health, you know, trying to save themselves essentially. And so I, I understand why this concept will be getting a lot of traction from employees. It's also though, um, a, a reaction to, and this gets me in trouble sometimes with the employer side of the house. Okay. Um, you know, we've talked before about how people who work from home often put in more hours and they, while they want flexibility, it's like, yeah, you can have all the flexible work you want, but you better be on that Tuesday morning meeting. Right. Uh, and, and as a result, many people, have been actually putting in more hours into the work they do for the exact same amount of money. Mm -hmm. And some employers depend on that. Yeah, they, they, they need you just to go to are going beyond. to drain as much of the energy and will to live from their workforce as they can. And they're on some level, that's good business, right? The more work you get out of somebody for the same amount of money that works. But why do people give discretionary effort? Well, fear of losing your job and peer pressure and all of that stuff only goes so far. People put in discretionary effort and extra work and don't mind working a little bit longer when they like their job, when that they totally are engaged, when they like the people they're working with, when they're doing good work. When people disengage, 
you run into this very transactional way of working where here's what you're paying me to do and I am doing it to whatever level best I can. And that's the agreement. And there is a, there's a change going on right now and it's been going on for a while in the employer employee um, contract, if you will. Okay. Okay. Um, used to be, if you put in that extra effort, if you work really hard, if you show that you're the bright shining student, you'll get a promotion and you'll, there's a career track and all of that. Well, that is no longer the case. Uh, more and more employers are letting older workers go and bringing in contractors or hiring younger workers. At the same time, employees have figured out they have some power here. Right. <laughs> and that's kind of a concept that workers had forgotten. Back in the days when everybody was, or more people were unionized, and there was this notion of hourly pay. Right. The, the idea of salary has kind of messed things up a bit. What was with hourly pay, it was very simple. I am paying you X amount for X amount hours of work, and this is what I expect. Right. And in union environments, when things got tense, mm -hmm. there was this lovely phrase called work to rule. Okay. I've heard that before. Can you define that for us? Meant, you are paying me for this. The contract says, I need to do this in order to get paid. Okay. This is what I am doing. I am not working extra time with no money. I'm not uh, doubling my output for no more money. I, it, the, the idea that this is a contract and I am going to live up to the exact word of the contract. So essentially, it's another phrase for quiet quitting. I guess we have had a phrase for well, it Well, that's what it ultimately boils down to is I have no intention of leaving my job, but I'm not giving you more of my life than we have agreed I am going to give you. Do we think that some of this, uh, I, I don't want to say change because clearly we've already discussed that this concept is not new, but part of it being more prevalent now is, you know, people have gotten comfortable working from home, having their, you know, work-life balance a little different and, you know, spending time with their families or all that kind of thing, as well as we know that with the great resignation, a lot of teams are short right now. There's not as many employees as there were before. So, you know, one person might be doing the role of two people. I mean, do we think that this is all related? And that's it's why it's so prevalent right now? It's all related and it's all connected. It's funny. I had a fairly snippy exchange on LinkedIn with somebody when I wrote about this and they said, oh yeah, this quiet quitting thing will stop just as soon as the economy turns bad and people need to keep their jobs. I've seen that too. I've seen that argument a lot. And so, you know, the kind of uber capitalists are like, well, the workers will learn their place when they get hungry. You know, it's like having a cat. When it gets hungry enough, they'll come home. Right. <laughs> they kind of look at it from that standpoint. It's just part of the tension. Uh, and, and here's the thing. That tension will always be there to one degree. I mean, especially with remote workers, the barriers to leaving your work, not just quiet quitting, but actually quitting. Yeah. The barriers are so much lower. Yeah, right? quit like, on Friday, start a new. Nothing yeah. changes. I need a new login and password. That yeah. is literally the only thing that changes from one job to the next. If I'm just looking at this as a pure transaction. So if mm -hmm. I'm not engaged with my work, if I don't care about my employer, if I don't care about the people that I work with, and this is just a transaction and it's purely time for money. And as long as I am living up to my end, I am doing what you pay me to do. That's kind of where it ends. That makes sense. So I guess, what are some signs of quiet quitting that leaders and organizations should be watching out for, especially with it being remote? It might be harder to see some of this, I would think. It's funny. Forget the term quiet quitting. It's the okay. exact same thing that you see when somebody starts to disengage. Okay. There is less proactive communication. People mm -hmm. don't speak unless spoken to. They don't participate in meetings. 
you hear from them less. They are less visible. I, I think that uh, obviously if there is a change in the quality of the work. Of course. Yeah, that one would be pretty obvious. If there's a change in the quality of the work, something is up, right? Mm -hmm. Find out, is a is it a performance problem? Is it an equipment problem? Is it an attitude problem, right? Yeah, it's a burnout. Is the person just burned out? Are they, un- you know, disengaged and they just don't care anymore? Mm-hmm. Uh, all those things need to be seen, but it requires paying attention <laughs> on the part right. of the employers, right? We need to see, are there changes going on here that are worthy of comment that we need to talk to people about? Uh, it has to do with the coaching conversations that we have Um you and I have talked several times about how those conversations in a remote environment become very checklist oriented. You know, I had a call with Kevin yesterday and he's like, what's on your Kevin list? And I go, what's on your Wayne list? And boom, 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 boom. Okay. We checked it all off. Great. But one of the important questions and Kevin to his credit usually asks it is how's it going? Right. Before we even started these podcasts, you and I started off, hey, how's it going? What's the updates and all that? Before we got into the check one podcast off, check another one off. <laughs> exactly. And and so, you know, yes, quite. And it's funny because by the time this airs, people will have forgotten that quiet quitting was a thing. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, really, look at it. Do a Google search by time. Right. Nobody heard of it. Nobody heard of it. Nobody heard of it. Oh, my God, quiet quitting. Everybody's quiet quitting. And now nobody's talking. (laughs) But it is, in fact, the place. If we're going to get really specific, quiet quitting is the place where the great resignation and employee engagement intersect. So, okay. So we've talked about, you know, some of the signs of quiet quitting. If you're a leader or in an organization and you see these signs, how do you approach it? Or, or do you? I mean, I can understand well, that, that could be really hard. You should be approaching it because part of your job as a leader, and in fact, in many organizations, more and more, it's becoming what I'm measured on is do my people stay and do they get other positions within the organization? You may not know this, but your boss is measured. Part of his or her performance evaluation is do your people stay in the organization or do we have to constantly keep replacing people? Right. We talk all the time about, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. And so if the manager is doing his or her job, part of that is not only are you getting your work done, but how are you getting your work done and how are you doing and what's next and what excites you and what's driving you crazy? Those are conversations that should be had in those weekly, bi-weekly, one-on-ones. Right. And we've talked about that before, too, that those conversations should be happening often. None of this should be a surprise. Exactly right. And so, you know, to put a big bow on this whole quiet quitting thing, I think it's, like I say, it's that intersection where that happens. Mm -hmm. It's more prevalent now simply because at the moment, people are kind of feeling their oats. They know that employers need them. Now, as the economy worsens, right, as Mm -hmm. inflation goes up, all of a sudden people's willingness to quit their job goes down because they need the money. Right. That totally makes sense. Right. And so the balance is kind of swinging back. Employers, the less (laughs) <laughs> the less altruistic ones and the more kind of uber capitalist types are rubbing their hands together and going, yay, times are tough. We can keep our people by right. sheer fear of being thrust out into the wilderness. But surely none of our listeners are part of that group. <laughs> well, we would hope not. And we would hope that even if you are working for somebody that it isn't an ideal situation, that you find ways to engage with your work and engage your satisfaction and keep the weasels at bay and all of that good stuff. Uh, Or you do a good job, you work to rule until you find a situation where you will be happier. 
Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And that's sometimes the option. I mean, sometimes if you really, really don't like your job, you're not doing anybody any favors. And and managers struggle with this because if you look at where we spend our time, right? Mm -hmm. If managers spent as much time making sure that their really good, solid, productive employees are happier and engaged and are getting what they need, we would care far less about those who aren't making it. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to, I mean, we've talked about this in, you know, blogs and podcasts and stuff of this idea that the people who are disengaged or whatever tend to get more uh, feedback, more attention than some of your rock star employees. Managers spend all their time on the problem children. Yes. That was the phrase I was looking for. Thank you. (laughs) It's not a very politically correct phrase, I grant you, but it's what happens. And very often, those are the people who, while you try to engage them and bring them aboard and help them, every once in a while, leaving the organization is the right thing for that person to do. Mm -hmm. And yet managers spend a lot of time with those folks while giving other people who are doing good work and want to be engaged, giving them plenty of reasons not to be happy. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's it. I mean, ultimately, there's your explanation. Uh, You know, it's an employee engagement issue. It's a business issue in terms of retention and productivity. And it's not all that new. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for answering our question about quiet quitting today. I think this was a great conversation. I really hope that it's been helpful to our listeners today. It has. It hasn't. I don't care. I'm just doing my job. Oh, hush. (laughs) I was like, I don't want to hear that. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to the Long Distance Work Life. For show notes, transcripts, and other resources, make sure to visit longdistanceworklife.com. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any future episodes. And while you're there, be sure to like and review. That helps our show reach more teammates and leaders just like you. Feel free to contact us via email or LinkedIn with the links in our show notes and let us know you listen to this episode or even suggest a a topic for Wayne and I to tackle in a future episode. And lastly, if you'd like to gain greater confidence with your virtual team, sign up for our Demystifying Remote Leadership video series at longdistanceworklife.com forward slash video. Thank you for joining us. And as Wayne likes to say, don't let the weasels get you down.